to be PowerPoint. So, um, and thank you everyone for showing up. So, my name is Adam Bishop, for those of you who do not know. And um, today I am defending my uh, master's thesis um, as a graduate student here at Highland, which is titled Paleomagnetic and Histography of Magnetic Susceptibility and Structural Data on Magma Replacement and Growth of the Cinder Cone. <laughs> so that's what we'll be talking about today. So, recent studies on rift zones suggest that cinder cones evolved the growth of a complex magma plumbing system. And due to the due, due to the discrete geometry, most cinder cones have been thought to evolve through a single eruption or even a single feed attack. We hypothesize that cinder cones conceal multiple magma conduits as opposed to a single conduit as envisioned for most volcanic constructs. The purpose of this research is to observe and understand the <coughs> fundamental system of how cinder cone volcanoes evolve through this plumbing system and how magma is redistributed in the Earth's crust. This could be challenging because most cinder cones erode easily and their outcrops are restricted to cliffs, ravines, or anthropogenic sites. You look at the bottom left corner here, this is a uh, mine uh, on the uh, Lafayette volcano in Vermont, France. Uh, Mike and I got the privilege to uh, go check this mine, and Dr. Ben Ryan and Danny got the privilege to check this mine out. Uh, the owner of this mine was able to mine this for you and leave all the different volcanic features there so we could take, make observations. So this is a rare site. So it what makes the Trotsky volcano also a rare site. <coughs> So, to gain a better understanding of the magma emplacement, the methods for the study will involve a macroscopic observation, an AMS study, and a paleomagnetic study. Um, before I proceed, I want you to think of, if you'll notice the uh, sombrero up here. So, if you want the PowerPoint, I'll have a uh, sombrero showing either a map view or a side cross section view. So, it'll help remind you which map is which. So, so, the geologic background. The Trotsky volcano is located along the European Cenozoic Rift System, which stretches all across Europe. Um, here we have France, the Switzerland, Germany, and Czech. And all these black lines with ticks on it are representing the rift system that's lived apart, much like the Rio Grande Rift System here in New Mexico. Um, the area of interest is in the northeastern corner of the Czech Republic along the Egret Robin Fault, which is in the northeastern section of Czech Republic. We're at the Czech Republic, and here's the Egret Robin Fault. And the Trotsky volcano is located within, within the TFC volcanic field, which is this, this right here. And here is a map of the Hitchin volcanic field. Each one of these red dots are volcanoes. The Trotsky volcano is located right here. And here is a cross section of the Trotsky volcano. As we can see the sombrero has been turned sideways. And the area of interest, so each one of these different colors is a different formation. And mostly sandstone and some moss stones. And the area of interest is within this red mark. And here is the Trotsky volcano, which is developed from a feeder dike or a dike, which is a igneous intrusion that cross cuts formations, and then once it reaches the surface, it becomes a feeder dike and it creates a volcano. And here is the cross section of the Chaucer volcano. Here's the, what it looks like today, and here's a cross section I developed to kind of give an idea of what we think the volcano is going to look like or it does look like. These are the conduits. These are all sequoia, the scoria bedding. This is welded scoria here. And we'll get into more details about that. All right. So AMS, anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility. What is it? It is, AMS is the property of being directionally dependent. It can help determine the petrol fabrics of rocks. Um, it can help determine the source of origin the structural evolution, and AMS 
is best visualized as an ellipsoid. We have an ellipsoid here and here, but if you look down at the pitch in the bottom, the ellipsoids can be can be determined by looking at three axes. You have the K1, the K2, and the K3, which is the long, intermediate, and the short axis. So this is how we can determine the shape of the ellipsoids. So if you look up here, the three the three dimensional ellipsoid. As it's rotating, you can see the three axes that are moving. It has little dots there that are indicating the locations of the axes. So what we need to do to be able to further or use this data, we need to be able to orientate the direction of the ellipsoid. And we can do this by using a stereo net. A stereo net is a 2D, it's a two-dimensional picture that is used to draw, to, to show three-dimensional data. So here is a three-dimensional scale on there. And what it is, it's basically a bowl, or the southern half of the hemisphere. If you were to take this ellipsoid and place it within the bowl, stop it from spinning, and then mark the locations of the three axes of the ellipsoid, you'll have something that looks like this. The blue square represents the bottom of this ellipsoid. It's going down into the ball. And the, uh, you have the intermediate and the short plotted. So that's what it would look like when you plot it on two dimensional. So this is some of my data. I've got a lot of this. But just to give you an understanding, each one of these right here represents a site. Within a site, we have several specimens of cores. And we will test each one of those specimens, of course, to get an average mean direction for each site. So they go through a lot of this just to get a simple average, the mean direction. So how is AMS used in that? Well, what we do is we sample the margins of a dike. Um, the magnetic fabric implication along dike's margins can help determine the direction and sense of magma flow. So if we take a look at this model, this, if we look at this model right here, this is a model of a dike. And we have the western edge of the dike, and we have the eastern edge of the dike. And if you take the specimens and you measure the ellipsoids in the directions, on this model, the ellipsoids are dipping to the west, on the west side. On the east side, the ellipsoids are dipping to the east. So it is safe to infer that the magma flow from this model, the magma is flowing up. And here's what they look like on a stereo map. And it looks like Greg Jeffrey is joining our session. So, uh, and here are some examples of my dikes that I use for the trusty dikes. And we'll go into more details about that. You take two, three, uh, take the margins, bottom of a stereo net, and then you look at a stereo net, and then you try to make a model of the dike. And then you can use the ellipsoid to infer a direction of flow. But we'll go in more detail about that. So, now paleomagnetism. What is paleomagnetism? The primary objective of paleomagnetic research is to obtain a record of the configuration of the Earth's geomagnetic field in the past. Um, if you look at this example of the model top right, Everybody knows that the Earth has a magnetic field that points out comes to the right and left, I mean north and south. Um, the geomagnetic field also will go through reversal, periods of reversals. And this happens on average every 100,000 years. The last reversal that we've been through was uh, over 780,000 years ago. So it was beautiful reversal. Um, even today, our pole is still wandering. This is done down here from 1976. Uh, this model started in 1976 and goes all the way to 2012. And every month they do a measurement of the location of the poles. And these are 50 meter increments here. So the pole at the north are still wandering today. In fact, it is said that <coughs> the, the, the Earth magnetic poles reduces its amount of wandering right before a reversal. <coughs> so we have very, very little magnetic hole wandering going on now. And if you look at the bottom left corner, these are the locations that we believe the poles were during the Triassic and the Triassic, Triassic and Jurassic period of time. 
and actually there's more in period there. But you can see how the pole has moved over the period of time. And we're able to track that record by looking at the paleomagnetic signature. So the paleomagnetic signature is recorded by the remnant magnetization of the magnetic minerals. So when you have a hot magma that's still liquefied, uh, what will happen before it's liquefied, and when it reaches a position towards not moving anymore, the remnant magnetization within the magnetic minerals will align themselves with the Earth's magnetic poles. So, and then as the rock begins to solidify and become hard, those signatures are then locked into the rocks. And then you have us geologists come along and we are able to take these rocks and stick it into our machines that we have here at Highlands University and test the paleomagnetic signature or limit magnetization. But paleomagnetism in AMS is just not as easy as it sounds. Before we can do all that good stuff, we must do a uh, we must characterize the magnetic properties of the rocks. Uh, we need to determine the magnetic domains, whether it's single, the pseudo domain, or multi domain. We need to be able to determine the what component magnetization we're looking at. And we also need to be able to characterize the mineralogy. What is the magnetic uh, mineralogy that is causing the, uh, the magnetic field of these rocks? So we we'll start with a uh, modified lower solar test. And what this does is, is these are curves of how we of demagnetizing our specimens. But when we take a specimen, it has a national limited magnetization. Just about everything we know of has some kind of magnetic properties. The equipment we have here in this lab, we can test the magnetic, the magnetic properties of water. That is how sensitive our equipment is. So what we do here is we start to demagnetize a sample. And we do it in increments of five, starting from zero, five, ten, fifteen, all the way up to fifty. And when we get to fifty, we do it in increments of ten. And we look at the coarsity or the behavior of the curves as they're being demagnetized. So this is your magnetization strength. And this is your applied fill, the fill that we're using to demagnetize the sample. So we do this three times to each specimen. Um, so we demagnetize it with a natural limit magnetization, which is our, the red one. And then the blue, the anastoristic limit magnetization, we induce it with another field. And then we demagnetize the sample again. And we look at the course of the curve. And then we have the saturation ribbon and isothermic thermal ribbon magnetization. This is where we induce it with a different type of field, and then we demagnetize the specimen again. And once we do all that, we can say we know that the SIR, SI, when the SIRM, the saturated ribbon of the saturated isothermal ribbon magnetization, is less than the and the anatomistic regular magnetization at the medium destructive field. You see these black lines right here in all these graphs? <coughs> when we demagnetize a sample, we're looking at the medium destructive field, the point in the middle from where it started and where it's been fully demagnetized. So when the SIRM is less than the ARM, the um, SIRM in this one is the green, ARM is blue, so the SIRM is more, I'm sorry, is greater than the ARM. You see the green is further out than the blue. So we know this is a multi domain component. Now, the rest of them all have where the SIRM is less than the ARM, we can determine these as a single domain. So that's what we do the Lori Photo Test. This is the impact field isothermal limited magnetization and the isothermal limited magnetization. Here, we're inducing a magnetization. We're seeing how much of the energy it can take to before it, it, it before it gets to 
um, the saturation with the magnetization. So it's oversaturated. It can't be any more magnetized. That's the strongest magnet is going to get. And we look at the coercivity or the behavior of the curve again. Most of our curves here are pretty similar all together, except for we have one. This is site two. It has a higher resistance or a higher coercivity to being magnetized. And that's why it's not grown up as fast. And on the on this side, the back field, so once we've induced the field, we then take the specimen, flip it over, and start inducing the field in a refresh manner, which will start demagnetizing the specimen. And we look at the coercivity of the curve here again as well. The red site two is has a higher coercivity. This is likely most of our most of my specimens or a titanium magnetite, magnetite. Um, this red one, I believe, is likely to be a hematite. And that's why it has a stronger, a higher coercivity. Um, some other tests that we need to do is we need to look at the S property. What is the fabric is very strong or very weak. Um, and we try to see if there's a correlation between S property and bulk susceptibility. Not much of a correlation there. Um, this next chart, is uh, we want to look at these shape factors. On our lift stories, are they oblate, as in panco pancake shape, like a pancake, or are they triaxial, meaning all axis, or exactly equal, which would make a perfect sphere, or, or are they oblate, like, I mean, prolate, like a cigar? Most of my data plots down here in the prolate. There is some triaxial and also some oblate shapes. But we can look at the shape factors of the, uh, the magnetic ellipsoids. This last graph down here is basically a comparison of this graph. You can do this to compare your data and make sure that you're still getting the same data and everything's looking good. And here is my uh, data table just for AMS, not, not even, nothing for paleomag here. But just wanted to you to take a look at that. Um, so vector diagrams. So vector diagrams is used to accept the direction and relative ma relative magnitude of the remnant magnetization in space. And it's also used to determine what are these rocks will form during a normal flaring or reverse flaring. We talked about that earlier. If we see the green, the inflammation is in the upper half, that is a reverse polarity. If we see the green in the lower half, like we see here, that is a normal polarity. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about the vector diagrams a little more so we get a better understanding. These vector diagrams are three-dimensional diagrams. So if you look on the left side, this is a top view. We have this umbrella again. You're looking down at the map. And in the right side is a side view of what you would see if you were standing on the side. Now, everybody see the red arrow there at the bottom? If you were standing where the red arrow is, and you were to sidestep around this map, uh, the one on the left, this, if you would pay attention to the graph on the right, you will see that we can look at the different, this is a three-dimensional graph, and we can look at the different that the component of the magnetization. And we do this because we need to be able to determine the different components. Or a better way for me to rephrase this is when a, when a rock is formed, it has the remnant magnetization. And it's possible that lightning strikes it or somebody walks by it with a giant magnet and remagnetizes this or does something strange to this rock. And we're only interested in the natural remnant magnetization. The natural remnant magnetization is the very last section of this vector diagram. We're not interested in the rest of this, so we need to be able to get rid of this and only apply this, because this is the information that holds the true paleo signature. So this actual vector diagram has one component there, two components, and then the third component. The third component of magnetization is the one we're interested in. So we have to look at the vector diagram of all of our specimens. And then last but not least, the curing points. Uh, curing points are used to help 
determine the magnetic radiance. What is a cutting point? Well, a cutting point for magnets are where when you heat up a magnet and they reach a temperature to where they're no longer magnetic, they become paramagnetic. That is called the cutting point. And if you look at this graph, we have two curves here, two lines. The red line is showing the measurements of the bulk susceptibility, which is the y-axis, and the <coughs> x-axis is the temperature. We start from 40 degrees Celsius all the way up to 700 degrees Celsius. And as we increase the temperature, the bulk susceptibility, the magnetic bulk susceptibility is increasing. And then around 250 or so, and then the bulk susceptibility starts to decrease. And then around 400, it starts to increase again. And then it goes down. Um, I want you to notice the blue in that line now. And this is the magnetic uh, bulk susceptibility behavior when the specimen is going through its cooling stages after it's been heated. Notice that the blue is now has a higher bulk susceptibility than the red. We'll talk more about that. So here are just some of my uh, sites here. Um, let's first talk about this one on the left. So if you look at the red line, as the temperature is being heated, it's increasing and increasing, and then when it reaches this point, it starts to decrease. Now, what can happen is as we increase the heat, and as far as the, the fabric of my specimens have more magnetic or magnetic mineralogy in here, the specimen can actually heat up to such a high temperature that new magnetic minerals will form. And that's what's happening, that's what's happening here. So the, if the magnetic properties are dropping, and they're decreasing, and then suddenly it's reaching a temperature for where we have a new mineral being formed. And then the bulk susceptibility increases again, and then dropping. So the last point, or the last point that we're getting is what we call a Hopkins peak. That's where we call it what the acuity point would be. Or if we can't find a Hopkins peak, we can sometimes use the infliction point to infer the acuity uh, temperature. Now, now we notice that we're still on this one, and notice that we have the new mineralogy made with the new bulk susceptibility. Notice the cooling curve. As this mineral went from no magnetism and back up, we now have a much stronger uh, magnet. We started with a very, very weak magnet. We heated it up to 700 degrees. A new magnet was formed, a stronger one, and it is our product. Um, this happens through most of our specimens. Or sites. Um, on site two, I decided not to heat up to 700 degrees, only to 300, and to see if the curve would retrace the steps on the way back, in which it still did. So we didn't make a new magnetic uh, mineral there. So if we go to 300, we won't make a new mineral, but if we go above that, we'll start making new magnetic properties. So by using, by determining the curing points, we can determine the titanium composition in magnetite. So magnetite, the mineral, is sometimes uh, infused with titanium or titanium. And what we're looking at is how much of the titanium is in the magnetite to give us a certain curing point. So once we know the curing point, we can get a suggested amount of titanium, and then we can use this graph here and infer the actual mineralogy. Most of my magnetic grains within my minerals are all mostly titanium magnetite, except for one uh, hematite. And here's the cure point chart. All right. So here is a Google map image of the Chosky volcano, showing the site locations. Um, site locations were selected based on different volcanic features, such as volcanic conduits, Dikes, uh, even um, flows, and even uh, cow bombs, or volcanic bombs. So, what I'm going to do here is tell the story of the Chosky volcano and what my data inferred from how this was formed. We have the first conduit here, which is called Baba. In Czech, that means old lady. Baba was born around during the Miocene, around 16 and a half million years ago. 
and here is a uh, picture uh, taken of it by an RC helicopter. And yes, the Shotsky volcano has a castle that was built on top of it in the uh, 1400s. And from my understanding, the castle has never been overtaken, uh, overthrown, never defeated, but uh, there's a, a guy that managed to trick himself into being the owner of it. So, a uh, real estate trick. Alright, so, how did the Trusty Volcano, or how did Father form? So, back to the sombrero, we're looking at a cross section again. So, the Trusty Volcano was started out in a dike, propagating, propagating its way <coughs> through the uh, formation, mostly sandstones. And as the dike reached the surface, it becomes what's called a feeder dike. We explode with an eruption, chuck in volcanic bombs, ash, Sequoia, Escorias, and starts to build a syndicate. And begins to cool, solidifies, and erodes a little bit. So, this is how Baba was formed. So, at each site, the samples were collected by using a gasoline powered drill with a non magnetic tiny tip. Then the sites were orientated by using a magnetic and sun compass to get the orientation of the inclinations and declinations of each site. Now let's start talking about the data. When we go to drill these sites, we drill them and then we label them A, B, C, D, e, F, and there's some two different margins here, so that way we can distinguish them. And here's a picture of a core hole, how big the core is. Each one of these little keys right here represents a centimeter. For site one, the um, father starts off in a reverse polarity. Um, yeah. And with a single component magnetization, very simple. Site one is a dike. I didn't get a picture of it. I, I wish I could go back and get another picture. But I did get a picture of me standing on the dike with everybody looking at it. So everybody's actually looking at the dike and I'm standing on top of it. <coughs> so we sample the margin, the west, the east side. We take several samples and then we take the mean direction and plot them on the stereo nets. Plot them on one main stereo net. The red represents the west side. The green represents the east side. That kind of looks like again. Now, since on this uh, particular diagram, the ellipsoids are not so much dipping, they're striking. The west side is striking to the northwest and southeast, and the green side is striking to the northeast to the southwest. So when we make a focus on a model, we're going to be looking at a map view. We'll be looking down since they're striking. Ah, the Southwest side is striking to the northeast. The northeast side is striking to the southwest. So we can infer that this has a sub horizontal flow towards the southeast. What does this mean? There's side 11 right there. This is flowing to the first Baba Khanda. So I can suggest by this, or by well, this information, I suggest that this might have been one of the original dikes that began to feed or form the Baba Khandra. Moving along, the next site is Site 20. <coughs> site 20 is a volcanic bomb. Can anybody spot the bomb? <laughs> so, remember we were talking about the volcanic bomb at Site 20 Lesson? Um, so this Chunk out and thrown out, and why do we call it a cow bomb? Because it's multi magma flying in the air. And then when it hits, it hits the ground, it goes splat, just like a cow pie. And um, <clears throat> so we decided to make some observations on this and do some uh, magnetic studies. Uh, this was also formed during a uh, bit solidified during a reversal. And the uh, shape for this were mostly uh, oblates, like cow pies, which we thought was really cool. All right, anyways. All right, so the next sites are all part of the Father Conduit. Uh, site 13, 14, and 15. Here's what it looks like from the side. 
you can see the castle wall over here and it's kind of big. Site 15, uh, 14, 15, and 16 were right located along right here, along the convent. And I wanted to point out the columnar jointing of the Bother convent. Columnar jointing is formed during the cooling process. Columnar jointing is just like the cracks in, uh, when mud, when they dry. So as your mud dries, it contracts. And when you get the contractions, you get columnar jointing. And this also happens with uh, your magma. And the edges cool a little faster than the center. The center has a more defined columnar jointing, which is real pretty, I thought it is. For all of the sites of the Baba conduit, all plotted in the reverse polarity, so this formed in a reversal. Moving on to site 10, which is a um, volcanic tube that's moving to a volcanic flow. Located right here. Um, the volcanic tube uh, flow plots in also a reverse polarity. If you can see this picture, we're all standing on top of it. This is the flow, and the tube is actually behind us. <coughs> The next sites are all part of the um, Pana conduit. Pana in Czech means virgin. So how did the Pana conduit form? Well, back to our original diagram, we have Baba here. And then one day, the site we up, we have a dike propagating along the old dike, working its way up. And then it pushed its way out the side of the bother exploding and erupted, forming Pana. And then over a period of time, the ground began to erode, and this is as we see it today. This is the cross-section. So here is also some site pictures, all this fair taken specimens from the conduit. There's the conduit itself. There we are, little these people over there. And I tied these on the stand of that, hoping that I may be able to apply a uh, flow direction. But I'm not able to get all the margins of the conduit. And I also need some more data, such as the actual strikes of the locations that I can get. So if I was to go back, I would probably have to spend some time to maybe infer the flow of the conduit. But it's pretty obvious which way the uh, conduit is flowing or getting. Um, all sides plotted with reverse polarity as well. All right. The next site is site four, which is which is a dike that plotted in reverse polarity again. Has a three to two component magnetization. And here's Danny standing next to the dike. Can anybody spot the dike? And remember, the dike is something is an intrusive uh, igneous that cost cuts its uh, <laughs> fabric. Okay. There we go. I've outlined it for you right there. So this, after the conduit was formed, this was then propagated through and then cross cut the actual conduit here. Um, we sampled the margins, the west, mar southwest margin, the northeast, and put it on a cross section, uh, a stereograph, and for this we have a cross section. The southwest is dipping, or it's almost vertical, to the northeast. Northeast is dipping to the southwest. For this, we can infer that this had a downwards incline flow to the southeast. What does this mean? That this was coming from, you know, I mean, it was going away from the source. <coughs> All right, moving on to the next site, site 18 and 19, these are the fun ones. Eight, site 18 and 19, 18 is what we refer to as a lava flow. It's steeply dipping because and the lava flow was probably flowing not near as deep, but something came up and pushed this lava flow up and over and tilted it. Um, site 19 is a dike. 
right next to the lava flow. Both 18 and 19, the green is in the bottom. This was formed through a normal polarity. So with just this information right here, I can tell you that the Chalky Volcano started erupting during a reverse polarity, and the duration of this volcano went from a reverse polarity all the way to a normal polarity. Does anybody remember how long a, on average, you're a reverse before? Not a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every 100,000 years. So that um, maybe gives you an idea. Uh, 18, several component aggregation. 19, just a single component. So to start 18, we're looking at a cross section. Look at my hat. Um, the northeast is dipping to the southwest, and the southwest is dipping to the southwest. So I, I can't, for this data, I can't infer whether it's been flowing up or down. But it is a lot of flow, so it's pretty sure it's safe that they flow flowing downwards. But it was flowing steep flow, either up or down, towards the northeast. There's a diagram over there, certainly pictures. What does that mean? That <coughs> site 18 was flowing away from the source. This was coming from the source. Site 19, the dike. The northeast, so we're looking at a map view because the um, the ellipsoids are striking, not dipping so much. Since they're striking, the northeast is striking to the southwest. Southwest is striking to the northeast. We can infer this has a sub horizontal flow to the northeast. For example, this is coming from the source. It's going away. And last but not least, site one. Here's the picture of site one taken from the RC helicopter. Gorgeous. Uh, I want you to pay close attention and notice how the castle wall will start right here and more sampling down here right underneath this castle wall. So this is the actual picture for our site one. And we're taking measurements that are orientating our samples. For site one, we're able to get the west, center, and the east margin to find more data here. West, center, and east. And cross-sectional view here, the <laughs> southwest is dipping to the northeast, northeast is dipping to the southwest, and the center is dipping to the southwest. So we can infer this has a downward incline flow in the southwest. And notice how that one is pointing to the source. Look, let's go back and take a look here. So it's coming from this area and it's going that way. So I'm pretty sure it was safe to say, or I'd like to say, that this particular dike was one of the main feeders for uh, pot. So uh, that is definitely something that, just by looking at, we've never been able to infer. All right, so we're taking a trip around the volcano, the Chosky Volcano. Um, during one of the eruptions, we have lava flows all the way out here. This is actually a little old mine site. We've got a all the trees are. <clears throat> and take a look, take a step back, take a look at it. Uh, I applied a topographic map to it so you can get an idea of the uh, topographic relief, the intensity. And that's what it looks like today if you match them up. And back to the cross sectional view. Now we know, you know what I mean by these are the condensed down here. And last but not least, this is the model that I designed that I believe that the Chosky volcano probably looked like at this last eruption. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to say that my research does support that most of the cones do form from multiple different eruptions. That silicones are not just one single eruption from one feeder bag. It's the product of the last eruption that conceals and hides the evidence of its past. So, if you have an opportunity, or anytime a volcano is exposing its plumbing system, you should definitely take advantage of it and study the volcanic features. So, conclusion <laughs> yes.
Pacific Coast do form by complex multiple different eruptions. And complex that means it is a system of things that come together to form a single cone. I also would like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Petronas, Dr. Lillard, uh, Vladimir, Ben from France, and Danny, New Mexico Geological Society, the um, National Geographic Society, and Sigma Xi for all helping uh, support and my friends for helping and support me with my research. So, any questions? Woo! Yes, questions. So how do you do the reversal? What causes the reversal every hundred thousand years? Does it take like slowly, quickly? I have read it a hundred times. Um, reversal, how do reversal reversals cause form? Well, the, the Earth's magnetic field is formed by the cores of the Earth also rotating. So we have the Earth rotating one direction and the core is not rotating that direction. I'm not going to say opposite direction, I'm not, but it is definitely, is it rotating the opposite direction? No. But, it's, so the core of the Earth is, would be magnetic minerals or creating a uh, Earth is magnetic field. So just because the core is rotating, it's also going to rotate in different directions. And as that rotates uh, different directions, it will change our reversals. Is that accurate? Cool. I'm explaining why the poles are constantly Yes, that's why they're constantly moving. Because the core of the earth is also rotating as well. Any more questions? Yes. Um, for the minerals, the mineralization, um, when you talk about the chemistry of it, you said that you were able to find out that it was iron and titanium together. Does it matter if it has a half-life? Yeah. For the magnetism? 